Hey ladies and gentlemen, Brian Boyle here. Welcome to episode 86 of The Mesh Tongue and uh, runpainless.com. So today is Monday, hopefully you are having a, a good start to your work week and hopefully you had a great weekend. If, uh, if you did anything fantastic, you had a great race, uh, uh, maybe you had a long run first uh, of, of, uh, uh, of your career, whatever it may be, leave those comments down below. I'd love to hear them. That uh, you know, this, is, uh, this is a place to share and uh, sharing is caring, as they always say. But uh, today I want to talk to you about the posterior tibialis, and uh, so we'll get into that in a little bit. I also want to give you an update on where I'm at with the, uh, the ketosis uh, and the ketogenic diet and, and uh, such, because I know we've had some questions, you know, hey, what is this? What is this thing? Is it, is it worth the, the expense? Um, the keto us is not inexpensive. You get online and you find it, uh, it is about $6 per serving per packet. So for 20 packets, it's about 130 bucks. That is not inexpensive by any means. <clears throat> you know, if you're thinking about that and you go, huh, uh, I've got running shoes, I've got race, I've got all these other things, is this something that you could sustain long term? And so that's really where I wanted to come into this uh, in, and say, hey, you know what? That's gonna be a personal decision up to you. All right? I don't know that I'm going to do this long term. Uh, can I afford it? Sure, I can afford it. Um, do I want to afford it though? And that's the thing. Do, do I want to pay this when maybe I can get to it and diet? I'll tell you this. Uh, I've taken the two days, uh, two day packets for the last four or five, and it's been five days. Today's Monday. Uh, so last five days, uh, I have seen definitely an increase in um, my ability to go longer without food, even with working out. Okay. The, uh, the key is eating a higher fat content diet, which was kind of hard because I'm not used to eating a whole lot of fatty foods. The reason you're in ketosis is that your body's burning fats. So you've got to really you know, think, okay, what am I eating fatty foods, you know, salad dressings, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of nuts and, and uh, uh, things that, uh, that you'd say, all right, you know, not really just like junk crap food, uh, but food fire, you know, fire higher fat content that uh, that is nutritional for you you know you need olive oils and things like that that uh, you know how can you add that and incorporate those in and and i guess you know while i have some of that stuff you know i usually try to shy away from the higher fat content uh eating more just a balanced diet and you know this really requires you to get into lower proteins uh you know going into a uh, you know lower carbohydrates and, and more higher fat so that, that's the tough thing I'm gonna tell you that uh, it's really kind of tough to go to you'd think okay well um, you know higher fats easy higher fat lower carbs that's the key okay so with that being said I have seen some improvements where I'm able to go longer without eating that's unusual for me I will give you that uh, I've definitely lost body fat I can tell that in just uh, uh, muscle definition and such uh, I haven't really changed any of my workout per se, and you know I'm eating probably about the same, uh, maybe even less. You know, because normally I'd, I'd feel like I had to eat something, and I'd probably overeat, and so I'd work out and, and uh, uh, probably carrying a little bit more extra body fat than I normally would have. But um, I'd like to see where this goes. I'm going to finish up the uh, the next uh, by next Sunday. I'll finish up my. Uh, my first box of this, uh, the Keto OS Max. We'll see where it goes. Uh, I may just try and go from there into the um, um, looking at the, the ketogenic diet um, from the standpoint of the higher fat once I'm in ketosis, kind of fast down into carbs and then go from that diet wise. And we'll see that. Well, again, maybe another experiment on, on, uh, on this and you can follow along and see what, uh, see what you're doing. So if you've had any experience and you're doing this uh, right now, go ahead and leave those comments below. Love to hear from you, see what, uh, see what your experiences are and uh, we'll go through this together. But today I want to talk to you about the posterior tibialis. And so what is the posterior tibialis? Posterior tibialis is a small muscle in the calf. It's on the inside. In a second, I'll show you here uh, in detail on my leg. I'll bring the camera in a little bit closer for right now. You don't need to see my big mug, you know, kind of sitting right in, in front of you. Um, but the uh, posterior tibialis is responsible for helping to maintain the arch in the foot. So when we think over pronation, we think maybe a weak posterior tibialis, uh, maybe uh, some other structures in the foot. Um, what will end up happening is I'll show you the reasons, uh, I'll, show, I'll show you the anatomy today. Uh, in the next episode tomorrow, I'll show you some tape techniques and some things that you can do to help with the posterior tibialis tendon, some exercises. So it'll be more, I'll just go right into the tape uh, and right into the exercises that we'll have that. But uh, the posterior tibialis, and let's, uh, let's bring this in here. 
Hi there. Okay, so posterior tibialis is a muscle that starts off right about here, maybe a little bit lower, about right there. Okay, it's gonna run down the outside or the inside of the ankle around, and then it's gonna come underneath to the middle of the foot. So one of the differential diagnoses is that we will kind of look at, okay, uh, on the inside of the foot, is it plantar fascia? Uh, is it a uh, midfoot sprain? Or is it this posterior tibialis? Because it's gonna be responsible for inverting the foot, okay, bringing the foot up. So if somebody's got a fallen arch, okay, quite oftentimes the navicular head here will drop, okay, so navicular drops, but it, with it, it'll snag and pull this posterior tibialis. So you can get all sorts of issues, whether it's weakness or sprain, strain sort of deal, okay. Um, so the key with this is that as we look at differential diagnosis, we're looking at, is it plantar fascia? Uh, does it change with activity, non-activity? Is it, you know, sort of first thing in the morning? Uh, does it change with mechanics? of the foot, um, you know, if you're walking, standing, those sorts of things, uh, does the arch fall? So when we think about this, quite oftentimes people will, will have a, a fallen navicular head, all right, and they'll come in, they'll go for a shoe, and they'll say, all right, well, we need, we need a more firm kind of midsole um, on the inside here, and you'll see some of the, uh, some of the shoes. Uh, Asics was always good about this, uh, putting this different density foam right here, okay, the, the EVA versus the polyethylene the polyethylene um, and so what would end up happening is that the theory would be that it would compress a little bit slower through the through the uh, the inside of the shoe all right and, and thus reduce over pronation um, you know since since the last 10 years it's probably less to do with over pronation um, you know over supination you're, you're hearing that talked about a lot less um, it is what it is but in reality, if you're looking at somebody's feet and they're kind of they're, they don't have much of an arch and you're having some pain, that's generally what I look for. Is I look for uh, this inside of the foot. You know, can we differentiate an ankle sprain? Okay, where one of these ligaments on the inside uh, has been sprained um, versus the posterior tibialis. And so we'll start poking. If you're sore here and you're sore here and you're sore here and you're sore here, chances are it's probably more posterior tibialis than plantar fascia and or an ankle sprain, especially if you haven't had any traumatic injury with that. But where do we normally see this? Normally see this in somebody that's increased their mileage uh, exponentially, uh, somebody that shoes may be uh, wearing out, uh, you know, or maybe, uh, you know, even with a normal wear pattern just tearing down here, okay, and they're really kind of flip-flopping so that you know, see those folks that their shoes are more like this versus this. Okay, shoes here, okay, and it's almost worn down, uh, and then they're really just kind of vaulting in. Again, that's typically where you would see that. Uh, cross country, you know, if you're running on uneven surfaces, trail running, that, you know, again, you can, you can kind of uh, uh, get an injury to the muscle there and, uh, and strain the muscle. So that's the posterior tibialis. Day one, tomorrow I'll show you taping and some exercises for that. If you have questions, feel free to let me know. Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at company 5K, the number 5K.com. I'd be happy to get those answered for you. If, uh, if you have a question about uh, you know, the, the posterior tibialis in general uh, and or anything else, be, be sure to uh, send those my way. As I always say, don't go hurting yourself to come back. But please, if you find some value in this, share this with your friends, your family, your training partners. And uh, I'll see you again tomorrow. This was episode 80, 86. So 86 of the Mesh Tongue. Tomorrow's 87. That's Tuesday. I'll see you again tomorrow. All right, have a great night.